Hi, this is Patrick Scott and welcome back to PLS 101, American Democracy and Citizenship. Uh, in this segment, we're going to be continuing our discussion of campaigns and elections by focusing most, more specifically on elections. We'll be covering the different kinds of elections, how elections and primaries differ from caucuses. We're going to be talking about the Electoral College as well, uh, some of the strengths and weaknesses of the Electoral College, and, um, and then once we're done with this, we'll, we'll have wrapped up this bit of material on campaigns and elections. Now, before we talk about elections, let's go ahead and deal with the concept of caucus because that tends to be one of the most confusing aspects to a lot of students. And yet a caucus is actually a very simple thing. And this changed over time. And let me, let me for example, for, first of all, talk to you about how it, how it used to be. Many years ago, back when you had the days of uh, machine politics, um, a caucus would be a meeting of party leaders who kind of sit in the back room and, and uh, handpick who their nominee was going to be for a given, a given election, for a given seat, you know, as a, as a nominee for that party. Um, but today, when we think of caucuses, it's basically uh, a, a meeting of people who are in a given party. It, the caucus is actually one of the oldest methods of securing a party nomination. It is like an election, but it's not a formal election. It's more or less an informal kind of election. So today, whenever a caucus is held, it's simply a local party meeting open to everyone who lives in a given precinct or district. Uh, technically, you, you, you don't have to be a member of the party, but in more, more cases than not, you will be obviously be a member of the party because you're part, of, you're part of the party faithful. But the citizens will meet and discuss and then vote for delegates to district and state conventions. So the purpose of the meeting is actually to, to, to vote for delegates that will, that will then go on to a, a district or a state convention. And these delegates are pledged to support a given candidate. Okay? Then these conventions then will nominate candidates for district and statewide offices. And also, about a third of the states will use caucuses for actually choosing delegates to the National Presidential Convention, which is what we talked about in our last segment. So, um, essentially in a caucus, then party members will choose delegates to the National Presidential Convention. The delegates chosen tend to be committed in advance to a particular presidential candidate. The most famous caucus of all is the Iowa caucus. And the reason why is because this is the first official election that is taking place during a presidential election year that gets the ball rolling. The Iowa caucus is very important. Even though the state of Iowa and the people who voted in the Iowa caucuses don't necessarily reflect the makeup of people as a whole, uh, they are very, very important for both the Republican Party and the, and the Democratic Party. Both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party will have their caucuses in Iowa, um, uh, not necessarily on the same day. But basically, what they will do when they're having their caucuses is that they will each hold these precinct meetings at more than 2,100 locations across the state of Iowa. Uh, they will be meeting in places like school classrooms, uh, they'll meeting rooms in, at the local library. Uh, fire stations, other kinds of community buildings. And if there is no community gathering place, they actually may be in a, like in a, well, a church basement or a bank or even the living rooms of, of private homes in the absence of available community uh, buildings. But basically what happens, and I'll talk about this in terms of both the Democrats and the Republicans, during the Iowa caucus, the Democrats will elect delegates to county conventions that reflect the, uh, their candidate preferences, who they want to be serve as their candidate. They'll also discuss platform issues, what should be going into the party platform for the state of Iowa, and they will also elect leadership for the precinct. The Republicans will do something similar. They'll elect their leadership for the precinct. They'll hold what's called a straw poll for the president. They'll also elect delegates to county conventions and consider platform issues as well. Now, these delegates are people who pledge to vote for one candidate or the other. All right, so by tallying which delegates support which candidate, you know which candidate's gonna win the nomination for each party from the state of Iowa. So essentially, that's, that's really how it works. And, and again, informally, let's say that the, the, uh, the party members are meeting in a living room or in, in a uh, school classroom. Um, They'll, they know who are the different candidates who are running, uh, who are who's trying to seek the, the nomination, of the, the Democratic nomination. 
And let's say again, let's let's look at Bill. Uh, I'm sorry, Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, and they will say, okay, for all of you who are in favor of uh, Barack Obama, move over here to this side of the room. For all of you who are in favor of John Edwards, move over here to this side of the room. For all of you who are in favor of Hillary Clinton, move over here to this side of the room. So basically, they begin to see right right quick, quickly how that is shaping out. Now that particular meeting room or that community classroom may have uh, officially may have a few delegates that will be going to the to the nominating convention. So so the, basically the purpose of this meeting is to select a total of maybe three delegates. And so when you're having this meeting then you're all working together you, you, you're, you're, and, and you divide up into separate groups depending upon who you want to see become elected uh, as your party's nominee for president. So one corner of the, of, of the room has got so many people who are, who are standing up in support of Hillary Clinton. So many people are standing up in another part of the room for uh, Barack Obama. And so many other people are standing up in another part of the room for either Bill Richardson or John Edwards. The beauty of the caucus is that they can kind of see right now how the, ta how the different votes are kind of shaping out. And so some people, they can take a break, they can change their mind, and they can actually convince other people who are standing in the other corner to come over and join them in this corner. They say, look, we've got the most people here in this corner, why don't you come and join us? And so they'll talk about and, and try, to, try to encourage people. And through that process, it's a bit of an iterative process, then they'll come up with basically a final tally. Now, if that particular precinct area has maybe three delegates are going to send to the convention, then, then basically let's say hypothetically that uh, Hillary ended up with the most support, so she would get maybe two of those delegates uh, that are pledged to support Hillary and Barack Obama had maybe one delegate so he, he would get one that would be going to uh, the state convention pledged ahead of time to support Barack Obama. So you take that idea and you multiply it through all the different types of precincts across the state of Iowa and then you begin to see very very quickly which delegates are which, which candidates have secured or, or won which delegates pledged to, to, for their support. And that's essentially how, how the caucus works. It's really an informal kind of election designed to um, select delegates that are pledged to nominate one candidate or over, over another. It's not that complicated, but again, a lot of people are a little bit confused about how that process really works. But it is, again, very, very different from the traditional caucuses that we used to see years ago from a strong party system where it's more of a hand-picking of, of the, uh, the, the nominees for, for a party's to represent a party in the election. Now, moving on from a caucus, which we do use, and again, Iowa is very, very important, we then move into the primaries. And primaries are used in, um, but if for, for all sorts of races, for congressional races, for local races, and also certainly for, for presidential races as well. And again, the primaries are in contrast to the general election. If you think about general elections, they're used also, of course, at the state and local level for all kinds of races, as well as the presidential races, as well as for members of Congress. So the general election, I think in terms of a sports analogy, is like the Super Bowl, whatever election you're talking about. That's the big, the big race. The primaries are essentially the playoffs where we figure out who are going to be the nominees for each of the party to, to, to go and compete in the general election. So, for primaries, most national, state, and local candidates are nominated in a primary. This is an election in which the party members select their candidates. In about two-thirds of the states, the delegates to the National and Republican National Convention, that's the Presidential Convention, are also chosen in the primaries, what we were talking about before. Now, there are different kinds of primaries I want to talk to you about, all right? One that we use here in Missouri is an open primary. Any registered voter may participate. You don't have to be a member of, the, of, of one or the other party when you vote in an open primary. Instead, what happens is you'll go to the voting place during the primary election that's being held, you'll go to your polling place, and basically you'll be asked, which ballot do you want? We're, gonna, we're having, in this case, maybe the Democratic primary, and the Republican primary happening on the same day. And they'll ask you as you come into the, to the polling place, which ballot do you want? Each ballot has a set of people who are within each party who are running for given offices. 
All right, so there may be, for example, the presidential election going on, the, so, 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 so you've got that. Not the election as a whole, but the, the nominating for the president, uh, the primary, going on at the same time as the nominations going on for the um, members of Congress as well, and also local races. So you go into the polling place and you say, okay, I think t I'm going to participate in the Republican primary. All right, well then, you will see on the ballot for president, who do you want to vote for? You want to vote for John McCain? You want to vote for Rudy Giuliani? Do you want to vote for Mitt Romney, Mike Huckabee? Select your choice, but you can only choose one. And by the way, once you've chosen one ballot, you're only going to get that ballot for that, that party. You're going to get the Republican ballot or the Democratic ballot. You can, once you've chosen to vote in, the, in this primary and get that ballot, that's all you, you cannot vote in the other primary. So let's say you've chosen to vote in the Republican primary. You get the Republican ballot. You've now cast your vote for the Republican nominee for president. You have other, other races to consider, too. There might be a, a Senate race up for grabs. Uh, there might be, again, for, for only for Republican candidates vying for office. Or, or it might be at, for, for members of Congress. It could be that Roy Blunt is running up against another candidate, another Republican, for nomination to, um, to the House of Representatives 7th District. Uh, you may have uh, city council vote. You may have uh, the mayor, people of the mayor on this ballot as well. So there could be several different elections going on at the same time during this primary and you're voting for your choice of candidates in, in this case, the Republican primary. Now, again, in Missouri, this is what we do. We have an open primary. Voters come in and request one ballot, a Democratic or Republican ballot, and participate in choosing the party's nominees uh, for a variety of offices. Now, there is also, besides a, 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 a a, an open primary, there's also something known as a blanket primary and a closed primary. Let me talk about the blanket primary, and this is actually used very, very rarely. Only in a few states allow a, a blanket primary. This is actually a form of an open primary. Here you see that you have a, 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 an opportunity where you can participate in both primaries at the same time. So. In one, for one particular office being contested, you can vote for uh, the set of Republican candidates, while in a different office being contested, you can vote for the set of Democratic candidates who are being contested, all right? Three states actually allow for the blanket cri pri uh, pr primary. So basically, you do this on an office-by-office -office basis. For the, for the Congress, I'm going to vote in the Republican primary. For the Senate, I'm going to, for the, or the House, the Republican. For the Senate, for the Democrat. For mayor, I'm going to vote back, go back to the, the uh, Republican primary. Um, and and that, that's how that will work. So you, did, you did do this office-by-office -office and decide which party candidates you want to select from. Um, and so you do this, again, for, 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 for uh, Secretary of State, for Governor, all kinds of offices that could be uh, listed on the ballot for during, during these primaries. Now, you have, therefore, you've got the open primary, sort of a form of that, the blanket primary, where you're, you're actually participating in, in, in more than one primary at the same time. Oh, but by the way, before we go on, let me also point out, too, is that once, like for example, in the, in, for the office of governor, once you've decided to say, I'm going to vote for the slot, one of three candidates in the Democratic primary for governor, once you've circled in one of those candidates for the Democratic primary, you cannot then go and vote in the Republican primary for governor, you see. You can only participate in one primary at a time per office being considered. Um, if you were, for example, in looking at, say, the race for governor, there were three Republican candidates and three Democratic candidates, and you happen to try pencil in both a Republican and a Democratic candidate, uh, that would make your ballot invalid for that race. All right, so you can't do that. And then the instructions would be very explicit about, about that, that you can't vote simultaneously you, for the same office in both primaries. Now, so we have the open primary, the blanket primary. Now, let's talk about the closed primary. The closed primary basically is one that is used in most states. In this case, you have to be registered with one party or the other, and you have to declare in advance that you are a member of one party or the other, oftentimes weeks in advance. Sometimes even when you're registering to vote in a given state like Georgia, you have to actually say, okay, you're registered to vote, but are you registering as a Republican or registering as a Democrat? And the reason why they ask you that, or another party too for that matter, 
But the reason why you're being asked that kind of question in closed primary states like Georgia is because you're only allowed to participate in those primaries. So basically, um, when you go to the voting booth and you're in a closed primary state, then they're going to look up your name, make sure that you are a registered voter, and automatically it's going to show that you are registered with one party or the other, and you will automatically be given the ballot for the party with which you're registered. All right. So unlike Missouri, if I'm in Georgia, I can't say I want to vote in the Democratic ballot, the Democratic primary, if I'm registered as a Republican. I have to, in that case, if I'm registered as a Republican, I can only participate in the Republican primary. All right. And so when I vote, I get a ballot only for that party, and I choose only those candidates who are on that ballot. And so that's the difference between a, a, cl a closed versus an open primary. Now, the book talks about other kinds of primaries, too. For example, in some states, if no one wins by a majority, uh, there may be a runoff primary, which is a subsequent election, basically between the two top winners in the first primary. So again, Georgia is a good example of that because they use runoff primaries. Um, let's say there are four candidates running for office, for, like for governor, four, four people running for the, the Democratic nomination for governor, and um, there is no clear majority winner, while the two top candidates will then go off and go, maybe go in a runoff primary, um, that will have, and that will be a subsequent election uh, weeks down the road. And then if you might imagine, in that situation, that means having to conduct another election and go through more campaigning and so forth. Um, now, part of this also I want to, want to point out is this. Why do you think that most states would require or use a closed primary as opposed to either an open or blanket primary? And the reason for that largely is because of this. Most, the, 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 most states use a closed primary because they want to make sure that the people who participate in those primaries are actually reflect, reflective of the values and the goals of that party. There's this idea of a spoiler effect that sometimes can take place. And here's, as you might begin to think about this, this is how this might work. And let's go, let's go back and, and look at Missouri as an example, which uses an open primary. Let's say that what you really want to do, and let's say that you are a, a, a Republican at heart, and you are really a, a strong Republican, and you are participating in the open primary. And for a lot of the seats and candidates who are running in, in this particular primary, you're very happy with any of those candidates in your party. Or you may realize that, uh, you know, I mean, the candidates are very strong, or there may be even be some offices like the governorship that where the, the candidate may be running unopposed. All right, so that person's the only person's name for, for that primary on the ballot. So you're thinking, you know, I inst I, I'm happy with any of the candidates on the Republican side. Maybe what I want to do is participate in the Democratic primary. Because after all, I can do that, right? It's an open primary state. I don't have to be registered with, the, with either party or declare in advance my affiliation. So when I go to the polling place and show them my card and show them my ID that I'm registered to vote here in Missouri, and then they ask me, well, which, which, ballot, which primary do you want to participate in? Which ballot do you want? And I say, give me the Democratic ballot. Now, think about this. What am I really trying to do here? I'm going to likely look for candidates that I see as the weaker candidates for each of the spots, for each of the uh, different seats that are being contested. Look for the weakest candidates because what I'm hoping is that the weak candidates will win if enough people like me are voting in the Democratic primary. If the weak candidates win, then my candidates in the general election will have a better shot at winning the, at the general election. So that's the idea of the spoiler effect. And, and again, it can take place in either case. It could be Democrats, Democratic sympathizers taking, uh, participating in the Republican primary, trying to undermine the candidates in the Republican primary to help advance their causes. So again, it takes place on both, both sides. Well, that idea of the spoiler effect is, is perhaps the principal reason why many states actually use the closed ballot instead of, or use a closed primary system as opposed to an open primary. Because they want to make sure that the people who are participating in the primary really are the party faithful, really do reflect the values of that party. And that obviously will prevent the spoiler effect from taking place. 
In some cases, the spoiler effect may be pretty marginal because, after all, that may be a few votes in favor of a weaker candidate. But by and large, though, having a close primary helps to guarantee or ensure that the people who are actually selecting candidates for the party's nomination really do, those, those, those voters really do share the goals, the values, the interest of uh, that party that they're, uh, for which they're participating in. Now let me tell you something else about primaries I think are also very important. We alluded to this earlier when we, uh, in, in a few um, discussions back. But we were talking about in terms of parties and campaigns and elections with primaries, thinking about who votes in the primaries. Uh, and we talk about turnout. You know, turnout in general election is pretty small. Well, turnout in primaries is often even smaller. If it's not a very significant election, you may be lucky to have a turnout in the primaries of, of the voters of about maybe 12 to 15 percent. So the point is this, who votes in the primaries? The people who vote in primaries are generally more of the party faithful. And to say that they're more the party faithful, that basically means they, mean they tend to be more ideological in their orientation. If you prefer to say extremist in their views, you can say that as well, because some of them would be. But they tend to be more ideological in their orientation than the average voter or the average Democrat or the average Republican, okay? Um, who only votes in the general election. Instead, the people who vote in the primaries are again more, more ideologically committed to their, to, to their cause. That's the true f believers, the party faithful. And so those who vote in, pr in primaries are largely party activists. And again, keep in mind only a fraction of people vote in the primaries. These people tend to be, uh, often tend to be more affluent, more educated, than those who vote in the general elections as well. And so what does this mean? And this is an important point I want, want to make sure you understand. The candidate who does well at the primary election may not do very well at the general election. And this is this particular problem in terms of presidential elections. Candidates who are nominated in the primary election may not have much appeal to the rank and file average American voter when it comes to general election time. All right, and I think about some examples of this. Uh, I go back to 1984. Ronald Reagan was running for re-election. The Democratic nominee was Michael, I'm sorry, was Walter Mondale. He ran against Wal uh, Ronald Reagan. Walter Mondale was perceived by many people as being too extreme ideologically. Walter Mondale is from Minnesota and he won basically in the Electoral College, in the general election, he won the state of Minnesota and the District of Columbia, and that was it. Ronald Reagan won in the Electoral College by a landslide, and the popular vote wasn't that, that far different, but, by, but the Electoral College showed almost a landslide for Ronald Reagan, one of the biggest uh, you know, wins by um, that big of a margin in, in the history of presidential elections. And, and the point here is I want to suggest to you is that Walter Mondale did great in the primaries. Uh, and the, his vice presidential candidate, by the way, was Geraldine Ferraro, uh, the first female to run for vice, had the, the vice presidential um, uh, nomination. And uh, they did great in the primaries. They, they appealed to the true believers, but it, when it came time for the general election, uh, they didn't do very well at all. I think about Michael Dukakis in 1988 when he ran uh, against George H.W. Uh, Bush. Um, George H.W. Bush won that election quite handily. Michael Dukakis was seen as a liberal Democrat from the state of Massachusetts, seen as being too liberal for the average rank and file voter. He tried to balance his ticket out uh, by selecting uh, Lloyd Benson, a senator from Texas, as his vice presidential nominee. Uh, but that, that really wasn't enough to, to convince the American voters uh, that uh, Michael Dukakis was uh, a, the better candidate. So he didn't do very well. So the Democrats' uh, leadership was scratching their heads and thinking, okay, well, we lost in 1984, we lost in 1988, what should we do in 1992? And so lo and behold, they had the Southern person from Arkansas, Bill Clinton, who seemed to have a lot of appeal with a lot of a, a very, very charismatic individual, had a lot of appeal with a lot of people, was very good at basically activating and, and, uh, the party faithful and getting them out to vote, but at the same time had such a great way of being able to speak to the rest of the America, and like I said before, by saying things like we're going to end welfare as we know it, 
and really reaching out broadly to, to um, um, the, that middle ground. And his vice presidential running mate was Al Gore, again, another Southerner um, being from Tennessee. And the idea was that you know, this actually presented more of a balanced kind of, of ticket as opposed to George H.W. Bush, who was running for re-election. And in that election, 1992, of course, Bill Clinton won the presidency. Kind of the same thing happened again in 1996 when Bill Clinton was running for re-election. He was running against Bob Dole, who was a former Senate Majority Leader, uh, a former Senator from Kansas. Bob Dole was basically perceived as being too extreme. He had done well in the primaries. He carried a lot of favor with Republican activists, but he was seeing as too far to the right. So again, we have situations here where, th where these occur. We can give you all kinds of other examples um, of, of, uh, that, that show these tendencies as well. Richard Nixon in 1972 won in a landslide against George McGovern from South Dakota because he was seen as being too extremist. John Kerry in, in 2004 against George W. Bush, again, was seen and portrayed as the most liberal senator in the Senate, has the most liberal Senate voting record. He did great in the primaries. But on the other hand, it was really hard for him to appeal to the average rank and file voter in the general election. And so George W. Bush won by a narrow margin in the 2004 election. Okay, so again, we see in a lot of ways how success at the primary level in a lot of ways does not translate to success at the general level. And, and so the key again goes back to that presidential campaign strategy is you've got to run to the middle as fast as you can. Once you secure your party's nomination, you've got to run to the middle and say things and, and, and make sure your policy positions and your, your, where you stand on the various issues really do appeal more to the rank and file. You don't want to alienate the, the, the true believers, but at the same time, you want to make sure that you are able to appeal to that moderate amount, a level. And I'll give you the last example in terms of 2008. What I thought was pretty interesting about John McCain when he was running for president was that John McCain was seen by many, particularly evangelical Christians, as being far too, not conservative enough and not reflecting their values. Uh, they would have preferred somebody more like Mike Huckabee uh, to have had the nomination, but John McCain won the nomination, and yet at the same time, a lot of people were very, very, you know, and again, in a lot of ways, that kind of fit that strategy of moving to the middle. But he really did not have the support of a lot of the party faithful, uh, particularly those who are among evangelical conservatives, who, in fact, one, one leader of the evangelical conservatives said that he wouldn't touch John McCain with a 10-foot foot pole. And so the idea here, again, you've got to be very careful on the one hand, trying to appeal to that broad base of where, where most of America sits, but at the same time, again, not alienating the party faithful because that party faithful are going to be the ones who are going to be contributing a lot by the way of money, time, and effort to helping you get elected. So again, it is a bit of a balancing act. Now, so those are the different kinds of elections that we've been talking about. The caucuses, the primaries, the different kinds of primaries, and how success at the primary level does not guarantee success at the general election. What I want to talk about now for a few minutes is something I've been holding off and waiting purposely for, and that is to talk a little bit about the Electoral College. What is it and how does it work? And, you know, given the recent history of what's been happening with elections, for example, the 2000 election between uh, George W. Bush and Al Gore, people really began to realize particularly the importance of the Electoral College. Now, going back again, as you may remember, the Electoral College was put in part of our con as part of our Constitution and Article 2 of our Constitution as an indirect way of electing the president. This particular mechanism at the time was designed to help satisfy the concerns of smaller states who felt like larger states would be, play a dominant role in selection of the presidency. Well, let me also say at the outset, because the Electoral College is provided for in the Constitution, to change the Electoral College, to get rid of the Electoral College, means that you've got to amend the Constitution. And as you know, it's very, very difficult to amend the Constitution. So what does this mean? That means basically the Electoral College is not going anywhere anytime soon. We're still going to be having the Electoral College. Now a lot of people are really confused about what is the Electoral College and what does it do and, 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 and why do we have it? Now we know why we have it. We have it because it's in the Constitution. And we're going to continue using it because of that, because we can't amend the Constitution. It's difficult as it is. 
So, but really what is it? A lot of times people think that when they're voting for the president, they're voting specifically for that one, one nominee or the other, um, or one candidate or the other, the Democratic candidate or the Republican candidate. But in reality, what they're doing, like in Missouri, when we're voting for the president, what we're really doing is we're not directly voting for it, say for example, McCain or Obama, but instead we're really voting for one of two slates or list of electors or people or delegates, if you will. They call them electors in this case. There are 11 electors on the Republican side, 11 on the Democratic side. So if you cast your vote for, or if you did at the time, cast your vote for, for John McCain, you were really voting for 11 electors. If it's Barack Obama, 11 electors on the Democratic side. And basically these electors have pledged their support for either McCain or Obama. Now, why do we have 11 here in Missouri? Because in Missouri we have 11 electoral votes. All right, 11 is the total number of congressional seats, uh, people that we have serving in Congress as a whole. We have nine representatives that, from Missouri that serve in the House of Representatives and then two senators, so nine plus two being 11. All right, so, so because of that, we select a total of 11 people to go to Washington, we have 11 electoral votes. So that roughly translates to population, right? Bigger states like California have many more electoral votes to give uh, as part of that as opposed to Missouri. Now, there are a number of different ways, talk about who these electors are, there are a number of different ways you can become an elector. You can be selected in a primary uh, or by a state party committee or be nominated at a state party convention. But these are basically the party faithful who have pledged their support. In fact, some of those people who might have gone to a presidential nominating convention, all right, might be some of the same people who end up being a delegate uh, as, a, as an elector but not guaranteed by any means. But again, these are party faithful. These are people who are activists in the party in Missouri, in the Democratic Party in Missouri or the Republican Party in Missouri. These are party faithful. Now, what happens is basically this, is once we have the general election that takes place in November of a presidential election year, all right, and we know on the basis of that direct, you know, the people's tallying of their votes, we know from the popular vote who won in Missouri. In this case, it was John McCain. He won by a small margin. So basically what that meant is that 11 electors then get to go on a bus ride or plane trip or whatever to the state capitol, in this case Jeff City, and formally and officially cast their vote in December for John McCain. So you have what's called the Electoral College that takes place in December where there's official statewide state uh, vote uh, tally that, that, is, that, that is accumulated and, and, and formally and officially announced who's going to be our next president. Uh, so these people meet in December after the November election and vote for the president and that's what makes it official. All right, but again, we already know who it's going to be because by and large, you know, um, the, peop when, when you, the, the person who wins the popular, the popular election, the popular vote, will also win the Electoral College. Whoever wins a majority or plurality will get all 11 electoral votes in Missouri, all right? Now, for example, in 1992, I believe uh, there was Bill Clinton running against George H.W. Bush running against Ross Perot. Bill Clinton won by about 49%. I mean, he got 49% of the vote, um, but more than either Bush or Perot. Well, because of that, even though Bill Clinton didn't win the majority, he did win the plurality, so he got all 11 electoral votes in Missouri. Clearly, if you win the, win the majority, then you also get 11 electoral votes as well. And so you get these 11 people who are pledged to cast uh, the, uh, your name for president. It's in, in Missouri, it's a winner-take-all system. You get all 11 electoral votes. And in fact, across all the states, except for Maine and Nebraska, it's a winner-take-all system. Maine and Nebraska are a little bit different because what they do, uh, just a little bit of side information, they allocate electors by congressional districts. There's, there's relatively smaller states with less population. So basically, the winner in each congressional district gets one electoral vote, and then there are two at-large electors, okay, and they're given to the plurality winner of the whole state. So basically, that's a little bit of an exception because it's not quite winner-take-all. 
But this is a method that has been used in Maine since I think 1972 and it's been used in Nebraska since 1996, okay? But basically, the rest of the states are all are winner take all, all right? Now, there are a total of, if you think about the number of representatives in Washington, we have 435 representatives and 100 senators. That's 535. But we also add three more electors for the District of Columbia, okay? So we have a total of 538 electoral college votes that are cast. All right, so to win the presidency, you basically need half plus one. Half of 538 is 269, half plus one is 270. So the magic number to win the presidency is, the two, magic is 270 electoral votes. Now, it's possible, so basically that's really how it works, you know, it's a winner take all. If, if McCain won in 2008 in Missouri, so he got 11 electoral votes. Uh, for all, you know, all the state of Missouri. Now, it's possible that you can get a majority of the popular vote and still not win um, because you didn't get a majority of the electoral college votes. And I'm going to talk about that in just a second, but let me first of all talk to you about this idea about having the states with the most payoff. Think about this. If you win the majority vote, even by one vote, in the state of California, in New York, Pennsylvania, Texas, Florida, Ohio, Illinois, uh, you would already have 210 or about 77 percent of the total electoral votes needed right there. So even if you only won in those seven states uh, with just 51 percent of the popular vote and you lost in 43 others, probably you, would, or, or, or certainly not all 43, but, but just a few, you know, many of the other states, you would still end up probably winning the Electoral College, all right? Now, it is conceivable that someone could win, uh, could get a majority of the popular vote, and still not win the election uh, because the electors changed their minds. Um, over half of the states, most states do allow electors to shift their votes, but this is very, very rare because, again, think about this. People are not going to change their votes like I'm an elector pledging to vote my, my vote for John McCain. I'm not going to shift and, 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 and change my vote for Barack Obama in terms of my official electoral vote. If, I'm, if I am one of the electors that gets to go to Jeff City and cast my official vote pledge to John McCain, I am not going to change my, my, my vote to, to Barack Obama because if I am a party faithful, that's almost tantamount to committing political suicide. There would have to be some kind of major scandal going on that would cause me to change my mind to, to cast my vote for somebody else for president in the Electoral College. Because if I didn't, if I did cast my vote for somebody else, you know, I would be pretty much no longer considered a part, member of the party faithful and whatever aspirations I may have had, future uh, opportunities for the party would be eliminated because I would not be considered, you know, uh, worth, worthy of, of becoming an elector down the road or for that matter or other things as well. So the point here is that the idea of faithless electors, that's not really what causes a, 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 a reason why um, people win, candidates win the popular vote but don't win the electoral college. The real reason is something else that's going on I'm going to talk about. But again, that's theoretically possible. Electors could change their mind. Some kind of catastrophe disaster happens and you begin to, or something about the, the candidate comes up that you realize, you know, I'm not going to do this. But in, in tw I think 29 states, they can change their minds. They're pledged to support the candidate of their party, but they may legally you know, change their minds. But other states, they actually cannot change their minds, but yet the majority, they can. Now, more specifically, more likely what's, what will happen is that a person wins a popular vote, but they lose the Electoral College because here's what can happen. I'm going to talk to you about this and give you a graphic to think of as well, but let me just first of all talk to you about this. Let's say that you're in a very, very tight race with your opponent. And in both the big states and the small states, you know, there is really, you, you really are running neck and neck. But let's say in many of those states, I win, maybe smaller, moderate states, I happen to win the electoral college, I mean, win the popular votes more often than not. And I'm winning all those electoral votes, and I'm doing very, very, very well. And, but, but my opponent's doing pretty well too. But then it gets down to maybe one state or two states left where I am losing by just a small margin, you know, just, just a couple hundred, hundred uh, gap in between or so, between my, my support and the support of my opponent. And in that particular state or states, 
my opponent happens to win. And maybe they were, they were big states, and so there were a fair number of electoral votes to give. Well, overall, while I have, may have, you know, in, 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 most, in many of the other states, I won overall tally of the popular, support, popular vote, because of that, maybe that one state where I did not win, I lost by just a small margin, but that state had a lot of electoral votes to give, that actually pushed my opponent over the edge and gave that opponent the presidency uh, as opposed to myself. And that, of course, was what happened in Florida in 2000 between Al Gore and George W. Bush. It was a very, very close relation, but when it came down to it in Florida, uh, George Bush won the electoral vote by just a few matter of margin of a few hundred. And because of that, uh, he ended up winning by just a few electoral votes more than Al Gore, although Al Gore actually won the popular vote, something across the United States by about 500,000. So it is conceivable, it is possible that you can lose the presidency, lose the electoral college vote, but yet win the majority popular vote. And now, um, again, that's a rare thing. Most of the times it goes hand in hand that whoever wins the electoral college will also win the popular vote. By, you know, 95, 90, 98, 99% of the time, actually, that, that does happen. But there have been some instances in our history where that has not happened. Now, you see I have a graphic here where I just want to give you a small example to reinforce the point, okay? Let's say you have just three states, just to make it simple. States one, two, and three, and you've got basically populations of each state. State number one has the smallest population of 500 people. And let's go ahead and just make it easy and give it five electoral votes total, because it's based upon population roughly, okay? State number two has 1,000 people, twice as many people. Let's give it twice as many electoral votes, 10 electoral votes. State number three is a little bit bigger state. It's got 5,000 people, and it's got, therefore, 50 electoral votes, okay? So five times as much as state number two will give it five times as many electoral votes, so it has 50 electoral votes. Now, let's pretend here's what happens when you have uh, the uh, tally of the results. Let's say here in state number one, candidate A gets 499 votes, candidate B only gets one vote. Who wins the electoral college in, this, in state number A? Can, candidate number uh, A does, right? In state number one, candidate A wins. State number two, 999 versus one. Who wins the electoral vote there? Candidate A also wins again. State number three, however, very, very close race. This time, candidate A wins 2499 votes, where candidate B wins 2501. Candidate B wins the majority of electoral votes in state number three, and therefore candidate B wins the electoral college vote for that state, okay, in this case 50. Now, if we were to tally the total popular vote between the two, look at the bottom here, you'll see for candidate A, candidate A ended up getting 3997 total votes. Candidate B only got 2503, but candidate B won very, very closely in, the, in the, the state that had the most payoff right there with state number three. But you see in terms of how you tally, at the, tally the electoral votes, candidate A ends up with a total of wins from state number one and two, five electoral votes and 10 electoral votes for a total of 15 electoral votes, where candidate B won none from the first two states, but all 50 in the third state. So in this case, candidate B has a total of 50 electoral votes, candidate B only has, I'm sorry, candidate A only has 15, and again, candidate B has 50. So, who wins the popular vote? In this case, candidate A. But who wins the electoral college? In this case, candidate B. It almost looks like a landslide, doesn't it? Even though candidate A, I mean, I'm using extreme examples here, but even in terms of the po popular vote, candidate A had a lot more in terms of total popular vote but in terms of the Electoral College, candidate B looks like he or she won by a landslide. And again, I painted that picture a little bit to show you the extremes, but I want you to understand the, the underlying principle here. And that is, if you really have a close race from one state to the next, and, uh, but maybe in a couple of states there, you know, uh, they have a lot of electoral votes to give, that may tip the balance in favor of, the, um, the, 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 of, of your opponent. Your opponent may end up winning the, the presidency because they had more electoral college votes, while even overall, across the rest of the country, you still ended up having more, uh, a greater percentage of the popular vote. 
So that's the idea of the Electoral College in a nutshell. Remember, when you're voting for president, you're really not voting for president. You're simply voting for a slate of electors. Okay, and that's really how it works. And very, very simple in, in a nutshell how it works. Uh, most of the time it does correspond with the popular vote, as you know. And, 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 but at the same time, there are those rare exceptions when you can win the popular and lose the Electoral College. Um, so, should we change the Electoral College? Well, again, I go back to the point. As much as many people would make the argument that we should change it, it's very, very difficult to do so because of the fact that you'd have to amend the Constitution. And the last thing I want to say about the Electoral College and why it's hard to also change it, even if it were fairly easy to amend the Constitution, you'd be have a lot of opposition to amending it. Let me tell you why. You think about small states like Hawaii and Alaska in terms of population, um, Delaware, Rhode Island, New Jersey. You know, a lot of these smaller states actually, Wyoming, Montana, a lot of these smaller states end up getting a lot more electoral punch or electoral power in the electoral college than they would if this were a direct vote for the, by, by popular vote. I mean, think about this. Um, in a state where that has maybe only one representative, all right, you have a, a, in a state with one representative, how many electoral college votes does that state have? A minimum of three, because you've got one plus two senators, right? So for some states that, are, that don't have much population, the electoral college triples their political clout in the presidential election. Even states that have maybe only two representatives, how many electoral co college votes do they end up getting? Four two representatives and two senators. So that doubles their electoral power in presidential elections. So the smaller states that have a fair, you know, small number of representatives uh, really like the Electoral College because it actually elevates the level of importance of their contribution to the overall tally in the Electoral College. So therefore, in a, in a lot of ways, even if we, it were relatively easy to amend the Constitution, I doubt we'd see much progress in changing the Electoral College because of the opposition from many of the smaller states that would prefer to keep their relative level of political clout um, you know, in the Electoral College. So that's all we want to say at this point about campaigns and elections. Again, you can tell, see that we've covered quite a bit of information um, about campaigns and elections and campaign finance reform and primaries and Electoral College and those kinds of things. What we'll be doing during our next segment, segment is talking about a different topic altogether, uh, and this is the role of interest groups, uh, not only in terms of their, their op operation through PACs, but also in terms of the role of interest groups, the power of interest groups, what they do in society, why interest groups are good, why interest groups may not be good. So we'll be talking a little bit about uh, that, their, their role in our political system during our next time. So for now, this is Patrick Scott for Political Science 101. We'll see you next time.